The views expressed on the following broadcasts do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT, Take 12 Radio, or our affiliates. The opinions on this show should not be considered as medical, psychological, or professional advice and are those of the host, co-host, and guest. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. One day at a time with its failures and fears With portion of pain and burden of care We must meet Welcome to Walking Through the Language of the Heart, a journey into the grapevine writings of Alcoholics Anonymous co-founder, Bill W. And now, here are your co-hosts, Chris S. and the Monty Man. Well, greetings one and all, and welcome to Walking Through the Language of the Heart. Uh, Chris S. is on the phone, and uh, we are going to unpack some more of this uh, wonderful book entitled The Language of the Heart, Bill W.'s Grapevine Writings from 1944 to 1970. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing great, Monty. I'm doing great. So what are we doing this week, my friend? Well, we are, we're in June 1948, so we're really clipping along here. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going over some of, some of the first iterations of the traditions. And, you know, I'm really enjoying myself because I'm very familiar with the traditions as they're laid out in the short and the long form and how they're laid out in the 12 steps and 12 traditions. But these earlier versions of the the traditions, I find very, very interesting because they're, you know, they're worded a little differently. They're, you know, they're uh, they're an earlier version. Certainly, Bill had set in his mind what these traditions were going to be. But the way he describes the language he uses was under construction. Yeah. So it's just very, very interesting uh, for me to, to go through this with you. Now, what we decided to do last week is we decided to read uh, the long form of the tradition before as it, as it's laid out, uh, you know, uh, officially today uh, to read that uh, first and then dive into uh, dive into the essay uh, in, in the book. So, I'll, you know, I'll do that. We're on tradition seven and we're going to probably do tradition eight uh, tonight. But let me read tradition seven long form. OK, it okay. says the AA group themselves ought to be fully supported by the voluntary contributions of their own members. We think that each group should soon achieve this ideal, that any public solicitation of funds using the name of Alcoholics Anonymous is highly dangerous, whether by group, clubs, hospitals, or other outside agencies, that acceptance of large gifts from any source or of contributions carrying any obligation, whatever, is unwise. Then, too, we view with much concern those AA treasuries which continue beyond prudent reserves to accumulate funds for no stated AA purpose. Experience has often warned us that nothing can so surely destroy our spiritual heritage as future disputes over uh, property, money, and authority. So, so that's the long form of tradition seven. And we're going to look. Uh, we're going to look at what he has to say about that tradition in June 1948, several years before it was finalized in the book Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions. So, with that, um, I'll get started. All we're right. On page 85 of um, of the book Language of the Heart, and it's Tradition Seven, June 1948. <laughs> Our growth continuing, the combined income of Alcoholics Anonymous members will soon reach the astounding total of a quarter of a billion dollars yearly. 
wow, mm. this is the direct result of AA membership. Sober, we now have it. Drunk, we would not. <laughs> That's interesting. He's ba he's basically <laughs> saying, you know, uh, we're we've got some cash now that we're sober, and if we would have kept drinking, we wouldn't have it. <laughs> um, by contrast, our overall AA expenses are trifling. For instance, the AA General Service Office now costs us a dollar fifty per member a year. As a fact, the New York office asks the groups for this sum twice a year because not all of them contribute. Even so, the sum per member is exceedingly small. If an AA happens to live in a large metropolitan center where an intergroup office is absolutely essential to handle heavy inquiries and hospital arrangements, he contributes or probably should contribute about $5 annually. To pay the rent of his own group meeting place and maybe coffee and donuts, he might drop $25 a year in the hat. Or if he belongs to a club, it could be $50. Um, in, in case he takes the AA grapevine, he squanders an extra $2.50. <laughs> so so he's, 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 kind of, uh, he's kind of taking an inventory of how much money yeah. each, each member would spend. So this is 1948. Um, you know, I don't know how many members Alcoholics had, Alcoholics Anonymous had in 1948, but if you figure a dollar fifty uh, per member, I, I don't know, maybe there was a hundred thousand members, maybe it'd be a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, the the expenses for Alcoholics Anonymous have obviously gone up. You know, we we speak about the prudent reserve here on this meeting every once in a while. It being close to twenty million dollars um, is is uh, the general services uh, prudent reserve. So, you know, things have changed. There's inflation. There's there's a lot more services today uh, that Alcoholics Anonymous uh, partakes in than they did in 1948. You know, there's translation departments and literature. Uh, it just there's all kinds of stuff. So, uh, Chris. So I don't I don't necessarily begrudge them the money. Yes. Yeah. Has the general service office ever bailed out a group well that's a good question i you know um i've never heard of that happening mm -hmm. uh bailed out a group in 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 what way well let, let's say a, a, you have a thriving group and it's bebopping along life year after year and then something happens maybe the membership drops a lot or just, it falls on hard times and they can't make their uh their financial agreement they've made with the church or the meeting hall or whatever and they're running the risk of losing their 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 meeting that they're the building they're meeting in uh, i was just curious because i know other organizations um service organizations if you will will help each other if that ever happens and i i was just curious if if uh new york has ever done that you know that's a really really good question i I don't have the I don't have the answer to that. I, yeah. You know, I do know that every once in a while um, um, the areas will contribute to conventions. They'll, they'll contribute to uh, uh, group functions of groups in the areas where uh, the groups meet. Uh, but I've never you know, I've never heard of a, a group needing to get money from it's usually your money goes the other direction yeah normally. sure you know money goes from the groups toward uh toward the structure but you know it certainly could have happened that uh, you know uh, i'm just i just would be unaware of it yeah i just wonder so it says here so so the AA member who really meets his group's responsibilities finds himself liable for about $5 a month on the average. <laughs> Yet his own personal income may be anywhere between $200 and $2,000 a month, the direct result of not drinking. $5 a month, wow. Now, now, now think about that. That's 1948. Let's say you go to your home group once a week. People are still putting a dollar yeah. in the basket. So that so really the money the money hasn't corrected for inflation no uh, since 1948 and I think as as members in good standing anybody that wants to be a member in good standing should consider that you know when uh, when the basket comes around that's that's how I feel about it I, I cannot in good um, conscience I can in good conscience personally myself uh, when the basket comes around 
just throw a dollar in there. That's just me. I, I usually have the ability to throw more in there. I mean, I know some people don't, and they should never be shamed for for that. Um, but I think there's a number of us that can and, and maybe ought to do a little better, uh, personally, I think. But um, but but I, I wonder, we've talked on this show before about the increase that Alcoholics Anonymous actually holds today financially than years ago. How is it if so many people are still putting a dollar in that we have so much money available to us now? You know, again, that's that's a good question. So so let's just consider that there's two million members. Yeah. And they each put a dollar in the basket every week. So that's that's two million dollars a week. It goes in the best. Now there's tons of tons of expenses. There's most of that money doesn't leave the group. It goes to rent and coffee and all that. But um, but that's still that's still significant. You know, you're, sure. you're looking at about a hundred million dollars a year. So um, so I think that's I think it's just in the increase in the membership that has enabled okay. um, the one dollar to continue to uh, to take care of things. And then there's, you know, the uh, general service makes money off of uh, literature sales. Um, one of the things that uh, I think most of us are aware of is if all of a sudden they're dipping into their prudent reserve, the price of a big book will go up uh, and and all of a sudden they're solvent again. And and if they're really solvent, the price of the big book will go back down. Uh, so they can adjust uh, they can adjust their income needs a lot of times uh, accordingly when you know pricing out literature. Sure. Okay, it says, but some will contend. Our friends want to give us uh, give us money to furnish the new that new clubhouse. We are a new small group. Most of us are still pretty broke. What then? I am sure that myriads of AA voices would now answer the new group saying, yes, we know just how you feel. We once solicited money ourselves. We even solicited publicly. We thought we could do a lot of good with other people's money, but we found that that kind of money was too hot to handle. It aroused unbelievable controversy. It simply wasn't worth it. Besides, it set a precedent which has tempted many people to use the valuable name of Alcoholics Anonymous for other than AA purposes. While there may be little harm in a small, friendly loan, which your group really means to repay, we really beg you to think hard before you ask uh, the most willing friend to make a large donation. You can, and you soon will, pay your own way. For each of you, these overhead expenses will never amount to more than the price of one bottle of good whiskey a month. <laughs> you will be everlastingly thankful if you pay this small obligation yourself. So e even more, you know, more than today, Alcoholics Anonymous was really worried about outs uh, outside influence. It was worried about people uh, giving large sums of money and then expecting, you know, certain behavior from the alcoholics or, or, or certain favors. Right. Um, that would that would happen to, to Bill Wilson and some of the early members. So he became very, very protective of that. But there's something to be said of us being self-supporting through our own contributions. I believe it's a spiritual principle. And, 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 and I believe it's a spiritual principle I should pay attention to. I should be self-supporting yes. through my own contributions. My family should be self-supporting through their own contributions contributions it's just it's just a spiritual principle and and it, you know it it protects the group from a lot of things that could happen i i can't you know i've i've worked around 5013c organizations i'm i'm a i'm, I'm a member of like five different boards and and they're all charitable you know they're all nonprofits right yeah and you know you should see the emails that go out at the end of the year you know we need you know 2500 dollars 
firm each of you, you know, and it's, it's just, it, it's not something that, uh, that, that Alcoholics Anonymous wants to deal with. So it's just smarter to keep expenses low. It, it's smarter to have group entities that operate on, uh, on a small amount of money that can be easily donated uh, uh, by, by members themselves. I, I think it's wise. Uh, what's your experience? Yeah, Monty? yeah. I, I, I think, you know, back to my question is, did, has New York ever bailed out a group? I, I've actually never seen a group come to the point where they needed that. I've seen them come close, but it seems like in every case that I've seen, the individual members, they step up to the plate. They just do. And uh, it isn't always just the same people either. Some of the new people do it. It's pretty amazing to watch. Or, or they'll have a fundraiser. Yeah. You know, maybe they'll have a dance or maybe they'll have a barbecue sure. or, or or a camp out or something uh, that costs very little. And, and they'll raise the money and and then the problems, the problems taken care of. One of the things I wanted to comment on was what you said about in your own personal life being being self-supporting. Um, I did a series uh, a number of years ago with a gal by the name Car- of Carol Ann, and it was on applying the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous in your personal and family life. And it is amazing how well you can transfer these principles and these traditions to your personal life and, and how much it will benefit you just personally. Yeah, there, there's, there's, there's no doubt there's spiritual principles. And when spiritual principles are applied, you get spiritual results. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, usually spiritual results are, are, you know, they bring you closer to God, not further that's away. That's right. So, so that's, you know, that's, that's definitely a good thing. You know, uh, back to, back to what you're talking about, about bailing out groups. Um, I'm from, I'm from the Northeast and sometimes rents can be higher, uh, you know, in more metropolitan type areas. And I've seen groups close down because they couldn't make the $25 a, a week rent. You know, they didn't have 25 members and, and some people were throwing in five bucks or 10 bucks. But it just it just wasn't cutting it, and mm. I, I've I've seen groups close down. Now now that's not that's not necessarily har- harmful to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know I, I've heard we you know we've had people from general service come and do talks at our groups, and 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 many of them have their own perspective and their own philosophy coming from the service structure, and and some of them believe that the that rather than have 10 small meetings, you should have one big one. Mm-hmm. That, that's what they think is the healthiest thing. Mm. Uh, rather than have 10 meetings with five people each, to have one, one meeting with 50 people. A- and, uh, and so sometimes some of the smaller groups are not cutting it and, and members aren't participating. And it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It, if a group is really doing its job, if it's carrying the message to the newcomer and it's got a lot of commitments and it's, you, you know, it, it's, it's very, very busy. Uh, it's, it, it's participating in the service structure. You know, it has the DCMs or GSRs. It has the treasurers. It has all, all, all these people. Uh, usually it's going to, usually it's going to be a healthy meeting. Sometimes where it's just one of those meetings where people come five minutes before the meeting starts and they leave right afterward. And that's about the the extent of their involvement in Alcoholics Anonymous. Some, sometimes those are the groups that, you know, uh, that kind of drift, drift away or, or fall apart. And I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing, you know, right. uh, God's got this, yeah. Monty. Does yeah. God not have this? Uh, yeah, God has this. A- absolutely. So now I'm thinking about something, and this may be a little bit of a rabbit trail, but um, I've thought about this before, and I keep forgetting to talk to you about it. Um, what I've seen, I'm thinking of a particular group that's that's pretty good size for our area. Uh, the group exists; it has a name, and there are several meetings 
I mean, there's like a, there's a there's a early morning meeting, there's a noon meeting, there's a candlelight meeting, and that is every day, right? And there's there's always controversy around what is group conscience. Um, is it the meeting that meets in the mornings group conscience, or is it the group conscience of the entire group that is named, you know, A plus B A A meeting? You know what I mean? Uh, you're smiling because I know you, you've run into this, right? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's like, you know, that happens in clubhouses and sometimes churches are, you know, they just throw open the door. You guys can have meetings here anytime you want. You know, yeah. the, 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 the pastor is, is in recovery or something. Right. And, uh, and, and that, that does happen. A lot of times each group has its own conscience and, and, you know, each meeting has its own uh, group conscience and they kind of do what they need to do but they need to cooperate with the facility. So, so if it's a clubhouse, you know, sometimes, sometimes the mem the members of uh, the board of the clubhouse or whatever are going to have certain things to say and certain positions to take, uh, but they really can't dictate to the meetings. You know, you know, right. we, we went over that. We basically went over that last week and the, the week before, you know, you can't, can't tell a meeting what to do. So, uh, uh, you know, the, other, other than you got to pay rent, you know, you got to clean up, you got to, you got to be a good, uh, you know, a good, a good, um, member of society, you know, if yeah. you're be using our facility. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, again, because Bill put these traditions together, he's he's basically telling us what he thinks is going to work best. Mm -hmm. You know, go forth, go forth right. and be fruitful. Right. <laughs> you, you, you know, make your own mistakes if you have to. Yeah. You, you know, these are not rules. So, um, so again, that's, that's, you know, that's a good question. I think each yeah. specific place is going to have their own challenge with that. Well, and I think, I think, um, so what I'm thinking, I've, I've not, so, so what I'm thinking of, what I'm thinking of here is, is like you have, let, let's call the group the Northern Oregon AA group. There's no such name, but let's just say that. The Northern Area, Area AA group has 52 meetings a week going on, right? Is, is it more common for decisions to be made based on group conscience at the business meeting of the entire organization or during a meeting of the individual group, like the 7 a.m. group? Because what I'm hearing is people say, it, it, you got to wait to the business meeting before you can make that decision. Each, each group is autonomous and, and they, can, they can run things the, the way they want to. Hopefully there's a charter or, or something that lays out specifically what the expectations yeah. are for, for group consciousness. But but it's been my experience that the person that goes to the seven o'clock AA, AA meeting is not going to the 11 o'clock at night right. AA meeting. So he's not going to want somebody, somebody at the 11 o'clock uh, meeting making decisions that are going to affect him. Yeah. So, so, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So th there can be, there can be some turbulence. Yeah. I'm Interesting. Sure. All right. <laughs> All right. It says, it says here, when reflecting on these things, why should not each of us tell himself, yes, we AAs were once a burden on everybody. We were takers. Now that we are sober by the grace of God, we become responsible citizens of the world. Why shouldn't we now about face and become thankful givers? Yes, it is high time we did. Now that's another, that's an, another spiritual principle. You know, I heard when I first came in, you know, when you first come in, you're a taker. You you, ha you almost have to be. You're taking everything. You're taking in, you know, all the information. You you know, you're you're asking for sponsors. You you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but you soon need to become uh, a giver. Right. Because takers don't last. Right. Takers are not going to last over the long haul. Uh, in in, uh, in in AA or any other twelve step. You know, you want to you want to become healthy and solid and consistent. What's going to happen is you're going to be one of the people that uh, people 
look for uh, help from, you know, you're, and you're willing to you're willing to give that help. Um, isn't, isn't that what you experienced personally, Monty? Sure, it, sure. It, it was for me. And, and, and you know, it come it comes down to when when you become a giver, you, you just you automatically receive. You shouldn't give motivated by the fact that you'll receive but but if you're giving open-handedly it it just becomes part of it and and uh, i i believe our creator provides our needs when we are helping to provide the needs of others and i think that is part of of the uh, altruistic mu- movement of alcoholics anonymous as well as many organizations and when we stop doing that when it's all about me um it's interesting how the blessings stop flowing. You know, one of the things I used to hear all the time uh, that the the old timers would be directing to the newcomers was this: "Get a job." <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you remember hearing that, Monty? Yeah, right? Sure. Now, yeah. I had the opportunity. I, I I get way too many opportunities to 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 help people. It's. <laughs> That sounds terrible, right? But but I mean, I get phone calls from people I've never met, you know, who want to work with me, which is bizarre to me, but it happens. <laughs> and this one indi- this one individual about a year ago called me up and said, "You were referred to me by so and so." I'm like, "Oh, thanks, so and so," you know. <laughs> so, but but anyway, this individual this individual was in a religion, and he he was a specific member of this religion in a specific category of this religion where you didn't work. You're not supposed to. Okay. You're supposed to study. <laughs> You're okay. not supposed to work. And, and, and I gotta I gotta tell you, I had I personally had a hard time with this individual. And this individual has a hard time staying sober and sound of mind and happy. He's like come always depressed and yet you know, I don't, I don't work with them anymore, but, but I'm like, what do you mean you don't work? What, wow. You know, it's against your religion to work. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? <laughs> what, you know, what religion is that? You know, I, right. I would have loved that. I would have loved that, you know, back in the day. Oh, sorry. I, you know, I'm sorry. I, I would take a job, but, uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm studying, uh, uh, you know, so, so and he was having a real hard time and and never 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 could never could get his feet uh to to gain traction to move forward and now i don't know if this that's the exact reason uh that it it was it wasn't working but you know i i pay attention and i see what people are doing and what they're not doing and and that that was a red flag for me you, you know what i mean uh you, you know you, you you, you you marry somebody and then and the, the, you know it it's designated in the the marriage decree <laughs> that you're not you're not gonna work <laughs> I, I don't know and maybe 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 I'm being unreasonable maybe I'm I'm being uh, I'm being prejudiced about uh, you know specific I, I don't know I just I just know that self-supporting through my own contributions has been beneficial to my my spiritual sure health. i i think bottom line is you don't work you don't eat <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay uh, you, you know uh, you know I, I listen there are people who can't work sure know, they're disabled or whatever yeah. I, I, that's that was not this person's case, right? You know what I mean. He could have, he could have <laughs> done a, he could have done a number of things. He's a very smart guy. So anyway, we are going to move on uh, to tradition eight. I'm going to read the long form of tradition eight, which is not that long at all. Okay, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional. We define professionalism as the occupation of counseling alcoholics for fees or higher. But we may employ alcoholics where they're going to perform those services for which we might otherwise have to engage non-alcoholics. Such special services may be well uh, uh, recompensed, but our usual AA 12-step work is never to be paid for. So that's that's one area in the traditions where Bill says never, <laughs> okay, ne- mm-hmm. never 
uh, never do 12 step work and, you know, and, and send them an invoice, you know, and, right. and I, I've got to be honest with you, money. I never have, you, you, you know what I mean? Now, now that doesn't mean you can't be a counselor. That doesn't mean, you know, there's even people who are, you know, uh, uh, sober companions and sober coaches. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to knock that stuff. There's a, there's enough people out there that are already knocking it. I'm not going to knock it, but, but there's something different about sitting across from somebody knee to knee and going through the steps with them. It, it, it would, it, 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 it would corrode that experience if it was something that you had to pay for or something you got paid for doing. I really believe that. You know, don't don't you? Ab- I absolutely agree. I can't even fathom sitting down across from somebody, big book in hand, and with a with a bell, and sixty minutes is up. Ding, time's up. All right, that'll be uh, that'll be thirty bucks. <laughs> yeah, you know what, what? What? We're not done with this step yet. <laughs> nope, time's up. See you next week. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, I'd be a rich man if, if <laughs> I could charge fifty dollars an hour. To Indeed, I'd, I'd be rich by now. I'd, I'd have a, I'd have a second home in the Bahamas. <laughs> but uh, you just, you just, you can't do it. It's, it's not even something that you want to think about doing. It. You know what I mean? No, no. But, all right. So let's see what he says in July nineteen forty-eight. Let's see what his vision of this particular tradition was then. Okay, it says here, throughout the world, AAs are 12-stepping with thousands of new prospects a month. Between one and 2,000 uh, of these sick, stick, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to start that again. Between okay. one and 2,000 of these stick on our first presentation. Past experience shows that most of the remainder will come back to us later on. Wow, wait a minute. Well, uh. Our past experience shows that most most of the remain. So it says between one and two thousand of these stick on our first presentation. Wow! Past experience shows that most of the remainder will come back to us later on. They're showing just how effective Alcoholics Anonymous was back in the forties. Mm. So the majority of people that started to work with someone stuck. Now, what does stuck mean? Stuck must mean that they get and stay sober, at least for a period of time, and become members in good standing in Alcoholics Anonymous. That must be what he means. And that's remarkable, because if you look at the amount of people that are coming into any 12-step organization today, the 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 sticking to it uh, statistic is much lower much lower than, right. than than what it was back in the 40s. And and I have I have a I, you know I've got my own theory and I know you've got your own theory my you know my theory is we started you with the program. We 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 did not start you with the meetings, we started you with the 12 steps. Yes. In the 40s. Okay? You you got you got a sponsor, the sponsor's primary responsibility was an adequate presentation of the 12 steps. He got about that business quickly and you stuck. Now, now today you can show up in groups and you can be there for 20 years, not knowing you're missing the whole program. You know, know, how do you know what you don't know? You know, you think sobriety is the whole point and, and you're missing recovery. So, it's just interesting. I, I love, you know, I love these places where it's pointed out that they got busy early on. Yeah. Almost entirely unorganized and completely non-professional. This mighty spiritual current is now flowing uh, from alcoholics who are well to those who are sick. One alcoholic talking to another. That's all. And it's, it's one alcoholic talking to another. You know what happens when we send people to meetings to get sober? It's 50 alcoholics talking to one alcoholic. It's not one alcoholic yeah. talking to another alcoholic. Right? 
Yes, unfortunately. How do you feel about that, Monty? Un- unfortunately, and that's the, and in fact, that becomes the theme for many meetings. You know, okay, everything's changing. We've got a newcomer. And now everybody's talking at the newcomer. You know, and depending on that person's experience with past traumas or relationships or whatever, you're scaring the poor guy or gal half out of their skin. And, and and they may or may not return, you know. Now, I'm not saying we leave them alone. I, I think it's just the opposite. I, th- I think we, 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 we're we welcoming, we're kind, we're compassionate. We, we do everything we can to make them feel comfortable. We certainly don't tell them that they have nothing to share and they're worth nothing at this point. I've heard that before. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I cringe sometimes when... when you know, you've got 35 people addressing this one poor soul um, and nobody's talking to, to him at the smoke break. Nobody's talking to him when after the meeting's over. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think we got some work to do, Chris. You know, in the 90s, um, I would uh, I went to a lot of step meetings because I, I didn't know any better, you know, the 12 step, 12 tradition meetings. And if a newcomer came in, it was traditional for, let's say you're on step nine, to, to go back to step one because there's somebody right. that's new. And what would happen is people weren't talking about the first step. They thought they were, but they weren't talking about the first step. Talking about the first step is explaining the physical craving, the mental obsession, right. how unmanageability presents, right? What they were doing was they were talking about their car crashes and their divorces and, and, you know, uh, being in the hospital and eating out of dumpsters. And they they were talking, and and like, that's not helpful. You know, the the person might never have eaten out of dumpsters. The the person might never have had a DUI. They they might think, oh my God, where the hell am I? But one on one, one on one, a sponsor, can identify and then explain what the problem of alcoholism is. I've never heard it explained in a 12 step and 12 tradition meeting. Never. It's always about the drama, you know? Yeah. But, but, but one-on-one a sponsor can identify and, and the person can talk and, you know, this is, this is what, this is what the obsession, this is how the obsession of the mind worked with me. You know, this is some of the, some of the things that happened when I started drinking, I always continued until I was unconscious, you know, how about you and, and back and forth. And there can be, there can be some identification. I, I, you know, maybe you could identify where 15 people are talking about the enormous tragedy of their life. But I think it's much better for that one alcoholic, talking to another alcoholic and for for some reason you know back in the 90s nobody was doing their job nobody was doing that it, they were expecting the magic to come from the meeting mm-hmm. and you know you you can you can see the amount of people sticking became ever smaller <laughs> you yeah know, when all of a sudden the meeting was doing the magic instead of the one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic do do you, you know think? What I mean? Yeah. Do you think? Do you think that some of that? Um, I want to be careful here because I, I I don't want to throw treatment under the the bus too badly here. But do you think some of that is because of a, a misunderstanding? Because in people that go through rehab centers or treatment programs, where a first step in a treatment program is completely different than working a first step out of the Big Book of AA. And so the first step, a lot of times in treatment, is your is your drunkalog or your drugalog, right? And and that's what we're delivering at the first step meeting, and that's not what we're supposed to be delivering. But that's because people don't know they 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 think that's what a first step is because of what's happened in treatment. What do you think? So so you know, I was in treatment in early 1989. And they made us write a life story. They were very, very interested in us putting together uh, a story about the consequences of our drinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the consequences of our drinking and the first step are two completely different things. Yeah. Okay. A non-alcoholic that drinks 
a quart a night, and there are non-alcoholics that drink a quart a night, are going to have the same consequences as an, as an alcoholic drinking a quart a night. It doesn't make you an alcoholic. Right. You know, so so I, I think it's important to understand what makes you an alcoholic. Uh, and, and I got that one-on-one. -on -one. I didn't get that from, uh, from a group. You know, like like I said, that everybody was interested in the drama of, you know, my, my life was worse than yours. <laughs> you know, right. the, the reverse bragging of, oh, you crashed five cars. I crashed six. <laughs> you know, it was like it was like top, top the top the drunk. But uh, but it's very, very important to understand really what the problem is, what the real problem yeah. is and what what alcoholism really is. Alcoholism is not the consequences of my drinking. Alcohol is is deeply within the relationship I have to alcohol. So, um, so again, that's that's right. kind of how I see that. It says here, could this vast and vital face-to-face -face effort ever be professionalized or even organized? Most most emphatically, it could not. Face-to-face, one-on-one. The few efforts to professionalize straight. 12-step work have always failed quickly. Today, no AA will tolerate the idea of paid AA therapists or organizers, nor does any AA like to be told just how he must handle that new prospect of his. No, this great life-saving stream can never be dammed up by paid do-gooders or professionals. Alcoholics Anonymous is never going to cut its own lifelines. To a man, we are sure of that. But what about those who serve us full time in other capacities? Are cooks, caretakers, and paid intergroup secretaries AA professionals? Because our thinking about these people is still unclear. We often feel and act as though uh, they were such. The impression of professionalism subtly attaches to them. So we frequently hear they are making money out of AA or that they are professionalizing AA. Seemingly, if they do take our AA dollars, they don't quite belong with us AAs anymore. We sometimes go further. We underpay them on the theory that they ought to be glad to cook for AA <laughs> sheep. Now, this is interesting. You, you, you don't hear you don't hear the criticism about the group, the intergroup secretaries or any of that anymore, or the cooks or the jet. You just just don't. But you know where you hear this a lot. You hear it a lot about the tapers. You hear it a lot about the people who yeah. go to conventions and record people and then sell the CDs or the cassettes to people that want to buy them. You know, I, I, you know, I'm really good friends with a number of tapers and I've heard stories galore from them. And, you know, I, I you know, I got to tell you, who is going to do that for free? Who's right. going to buy all this recording equipment and, you know, and, and burn CDs and pay all kinds of money for, you know, for, for the, the, uh, the, the containers or, you know, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and travel miles and miles, pay for a hotel, you know, to, to record every convention in their area. Nobody. Right. You know, just, just like you can't expect somebody, you can't expect somebody to be a secretary at the inner group day after day after day after day for fun and for free. It's, it's outside of 12 step work. Now, does it serve a 12 step function? Yes, but it's not one on one 12 step work. Right. And I think that's really what, the, what he's right. talking about here. Now, isn't this carrying our fears of professionalism rather far? If these fears ever got too strong, none but a saint or an incompetent could work for Alcoholics Anonymous. Our supply of saints being quite small, <coughs> we would certainly wind up with less competent workers than we need. We are beginning to see that our few paid workers are performing only those services, service tasks that our volunteers cannot consistently handle. Primarily, these folks are not doing 12-step work. They are just making more and better 12-step work possible. More and better 12-step work possible. Secretaries at their desks are valuable points of contact, information, and public relations. That is what they are paid for and nothing else. They help carry the good news of AA to the outside world and bring our prospects face-to-face -face with us. That's not AA therapy. It's just a lot of very necessary but often thankless 
were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love the way he puts it together. I actually like this probably more than I like the essay in the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions on Tradition 8. He's, he's a lot more clear, I think, yeah, on very. what we can do and what we can't do, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. You know, don't you think so? Yeah, Mike? I, I, I love it. That, that sentence that you repeated uh, there, uh, bared repeating. Um, they are they they are just making more and better twelve step work possible. Th that's what they're doing. They're 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 contributing, and you know it's a spiritual sure. principle. A man is worthy of his hire. That's a spiritual principle. You know you can't expect people to 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 do the amount of work that some of these people do and not pay them for it. You know, especially when you're talking about the service structure, uh, you know, listen, there's there's board members and stuff like that that, that do do a lot of AA work for for fun and for free. But um, but, you know, s specific tasks uh, where you're really expected to be there a certain amount of hours, you know, every day. Yeah, uh, of course. Of course, we're going to pay those people and we should pay them, you know, the prevailing you know, rate for that type of work. And I think that's another, uh, another piece of, of this, you know, Bill says it in many, many different places that, you know, we shouldn't underpay them because they're doing AA stuff. You know, uh, you're, you're lucky you're an AA janitor. You, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm sorry that that doesn't really cut it. Well, you know, Chris, I got to tell you, uh, there, there's some, uh, Bless their little hearts. Uh, and you know, I'm very connected to the faith community. There's some churches that really ought to grab onto this concept. Because what I hear a lot of times is, well, you know, it's ministry, right? The reason that we're working you so hard and the reason why you're having to put in 50 hours instead of 40, you know, 10 of, of which aren't getting paid. You know, it's ministry. You know what you signed up for. And I'm like, yeah, I don't buy that. I just don't buy that. So uh, once again, Alcoholics Anonymous comes through with some ideas that I think uh, members of our faith community could benefit from. Sure, sure. You know, yeah. you're a church member. You should be painting the barn, you know, on right. Tuesday morning. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that just it doesn't cut it. No. I, I'm definitely with you. So where needed, let's revive our attitude toward those who labor at our special services. Let us treat them as AA associates and not as hired help. Let's let's recompense them fairly and above all, let's ab absolve them from the label of professionalism. Let us also distinguish clearly between organizing the AA movement and setting up in a reasonable business-like manner a few essential services of contact and propagation. Once we do that, all will be well. The million or so fellow alcoholics who are still sick will then continue to get the break we 60,000 AAs have already had. So he's telling us 60,000 AAs. Mm. Okay, good. In 1948. Let's give our service desks the hand they so well deserve. And I love how he's spelled this out because, you know, Bill is great at seeing problems before they become problems. Yes. Now, he might have experienced them as problems as well, but he was also very, very, very far seeing, very prophetic, you know, and OK, these are the problems we're going to have. Let's resolve these, you know, in, in, in a logical, uh, spiritual way. Let's put down in writing, uh, you know, what we think the best practice is going to be in in some specific situation, and uh, and you know, let 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 God take up the slack. And He was just so so good at, at doing this. Yeah, um, I'm really enjoying these writings, Monty. I, I am I am more impressed, and I've always been impressed with Bill W's ability at, at being a wordsmith. But uh, I'm blown away by this even more. Uh, this is this is great stuff. Well, listeners, that wraps it up for this week. Um, for those of you who may be tuning into this, 
a year after we record it. Uh, this may not make any sense to you, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, next week, we will not be taping this show, uh, but we'll be back with you the week after that. Now, those of you who are listening to this later on, doesn't matter. You can just go to the next show. Um, and that brings me to another point. We really encourage you to subscribe either on any of the major podcasting platforms listed on our website at Take12Radio.com or subscribing on our YouTube channel, also listed at Take12Radio.com. And, and that way you can keep up on these shows as well as other shows uh, presented by Take 12 Recovery Radio as, as well. Um, we have several workshops on our workshops page. We have recovery music. Um, as a matter of fact, um, again, this is date-oriented, but this coming Monday, I am... Uh, playing a uh, doing a rebroadcast of my interview with Rusty Golden, the son of William Lee Golden uh, of the Oak Ridge Boys. And Rusty has a tremendous story of experience, strength, and hope. He's going to be sharing four of his recovery songs on, on that show uh, as well. But you can find all that stuff in our archives if you subscribe uh, either on our YouTube channel or on any of the major podcasting platforms. So, so there you go. Chris, thank you so much. All right, my friends, until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man along with Chris S., and we are wishing God's perfect serenity for you. For more recovery workshops with Chris S. and the Monty Man, visit our website at Take12Radio.com and click on the Recovery Workshops banner. This has been a broadcast of Take 12 Recovery Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Meow, meow, meow. Woof, woof. <laughs>